so this is a cancer fellow. Uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, him and his life, his long life in the rock and roll business and stuff. Uh, well, let's we'll start uh, with the beginning, I guess. Uh, where are you from? Well, I was born in uh, Los Angeles, but I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. In Seattle? Even weirder than Seattle, uh, a little town called Bellingham, Washington, uh, which uh, actually had some other bands come from there, like Death Cab for Cutie came from there, etc. It's just this little college town where records were hard to get, um, and you had to kind of be very clever and creative to know what's going on in the world, um, which was, you know, yeah, kind of cool. internet in those days, yeah, too. People used to tell each other, listen to this. This is good, this is that. So, about what what uh, period did you, did you start your first band? It was before the grunge, at okay. the time of the Melvins, or? Way before. Way before, yeah. you're talking so early, early My, my, early my first band, I started in 1981. Yeah. But, you know, we were all like 12, 13 years old. And it wasn't like a very cool band or anything, but we were, you know, just doing our thing. Anything to, like, relieve the boredom of being in this small shit town. Yeah, exactly. So what was your influence? What's the, what's the reason you started playing music? First guitar, piano, or what? First the piano, and then the guitar, um, the guitar being much easier. <laughs> um, and, you know, I started getting into bands. I mean, like, punk rock was still in this town, like, barely on the radar. So the first things I heard were, like, Led Zeppelin. Yeah, it's <laughs> usual. Uh, it kind of thing. Yeah. So, like, you know, that was what I was into, and then, uh, I don't know which record was first, but I think I basically, I basically read about this band Black Flag, and I just you know these records just weren't anywhere to be found in Bellingham. And I was like, well, this sounds like something kind of cool. What about what about the Sepulcher, the Dickies, uh, Social Distortion? I didn't know those bands yet. The, 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 the news coming to Bellingham, Washington was a trickle. So what, what about the, the English punk wave, the Clash? Uh, yeah, well, they had the Clash. Sure, we heard the Clash. I mean, because the Clash started having hit records in the States, so that was pretty easy. But, you know, the first step into, like, non-major label music, you know, was, was Black Flag. And my mom actually went to Washington, D.C. for business. I said, find a record by Black Flag. They probably have them there. Yeah, and this is obviously pre Henry, pre Henry Rollins, huh? obviously. Actually, I think by then it was Henry Rollins. It was already? Yeah. Then? Okay. All right. So what about the Ramones? So, yeah, once again, like, just re reading about stuff. And the album that I bought first was Subterranean Jungle. Uh, which I love. Great album. Yeah. Good song. And, and then I, I saw the Ramones around this time, but uh, it was the brief period, it was Too Tough to Die. So it was Richie on um, drums. Yeah. So that was my, and that was, that was the only time I saw them with Dee Dee. Uh, and I've told the story before, but I'll tell it again. It was a great show. My parents drove me to Seattle, which takes like an hour and a half, and they waited in the car. So uh, I think they might have gone ahead of <laughs> generally in the but anyway, the, the show started, and they were great, they were rocking, and like 20 minutes into the show, somebody threw a shoe at Didi, and he got, it, uh, and he got in the audience and went and had a fight. And but they didn't fall, they didn't fall any butt, sorry about the, the word, but when you saw them, and usually when you don't know, you know, songs from bands and stuff, especially the Ramones, it sounds like if you don't know them, it sounds like the same song the whole time. Uh, but did you feel there was something special, like the first time? The first time you saw Nirvana or something, I mean, it's rare to go to go and see people which you don't know their song and enjoy the show. Well, I knew I the songs because I, mean, yeah. I had those couple of records, you know, and and so I and they were playing a lot of songs from that time. You know, they were playing as many songs from. I think they're just trying to push the record too a little bit. Okay. They're playing a lot of songs from Two After Die, and they played songs from Subterranean Jungle as well as you know all. Yeah, all, all quiet, all songs. quiet on the eastern front, which is one of my favorite video uh, song actually. So in the jungle and stuff. All right, so then, uh, then you get to the poses, and uh, that's your first. Uh... So the, yeah, so after then there was high school, and then there was you know I met my future bandmate John Hour, who was also another you know misfit kid from Bellingham like me. We liked all kinds of things, you know, and uh, and then we just started playing in bands, and the, the Posies band is what we kind of arrived at, which was a much more um, you know, like songwritery kind of thing. 
Which was definitely not what was going on in Seattle. We, then I moved to Seattle and started going to the University of Washington, and I couldn't see very many of the bands because they were playing in bars and I wasn't old enough to get in. But they did have some all ages shows in Tacoma. So I could go see, I saw like the U-Men. I saw very early Soundgarden shows. Um, you know, because I wanted to see bands like the Buckle Surfers, things like this. I went to those shows, uh, which were pretty important for me. Yeah. Uh, and they always had Seattle bands playing, you know, on the bill. So I started to get a little idea of what was going on. Did you see uh, Battle of Bone at the time? Or? Well, yeah, that's even later, you know, because yeah. then that's like more like 89-ish yeah. that they're starting to play a lot. Um, because, you know, like Green River, I saw like, the end of Green River, they played like, and, the, and then Mother Love Bone, and then Pearl Jam. But by the time it turned into Pearl Jam, it was maybe a little bit too, too a little, the early yeah, Pearl Jam for me was sad. like more, what sounded a little too bar band for me, personally. But I, you know, for me, like Nirvana was a great band because they were as wild as anything going on, but they had these incredible melodies. You know, no, but like it wasn't say, so, something special or something magic, I would say. You know, it happened to me three times in my life. I think when I saw uh, first uh, the fish bones, mm -hmm. it was the Red Sheep Pepper in '84 at the Ritz. I don't remember the Red Sheep Pepper, but fish bone, the fish bone that fell on my butt. Mm -hmm. uh, when I saw the Ramones in '76, and when I saw Nirvana, but the three times uh, I didn't know the songs, and I really, really fell down. Uh, I mean, there was something magic, some power which you can't really explain. You know. So yeah, but that's my opinion. Anyways, so so when did you when did you uh, get signed and uh, where and uh, well, you know we had this album that we put out on a small label in Seattle um, called Pop Llama um, that did have some bands that eventually would be on Sub Pop like my ex-wife band the Fastbacks on Pop Llama and the Walkabouts, you know, um, but. Um, a lot of our friends were on this label and we, we admired those bands, so uh, we put out this record and it kind of exploded in Seattle. In the like college or on the, on the main, main stream radio? Everywhere at once. It was very strange and, you know, the album is, that first album of the Posies is very retro and very acoustic and I think almost simply because it was so different from what was happening, people took notice to it. I mean, yeah, yeah, this certain niche was different from the ground, you know, like, uh, that stuff, yeah. and, and people were excited about it, especially like really young people. Again, most of the bands from the grunge world, you know, were playing in bars um, and were just a couple, three years older than me, for example. So our fans were like my age and younger, um, and that kind of, they didn't have their own band in a way to, to, to like. Uh, but in, in LA, in LA, LA, bar, in LA so. all the punk scene used to be in the, in the, in the basements and friends' houses because people, the kids couldn't go to, to bars and, uh, and watch, uh, watch all the bands. So. And, and strangely yeah. enough, we didn't really have this in it's Seattle. It's in Seattle. Yeah, it, so. may, maybe like, I mean, I, maybe before like I moved here, like in the early 80s, like Black Flag never played a club in Seattle as far as I know. They played houses. Yeah. But it was, but by the time I arrived, you know, it's just so easy for these bands to play in bars that they just did that, and they didn't have the same rule to try and make it accessible. They just, I guess, because they needed to play, they played in bars. All right. So let's go back to the poses. So after the first album, what happened to the rest, uh, the rest of America, the rest of the world? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So then we we got our deal with Geffen Records, and which was, you know, a, a, in what year? In 1989. Okay. And everything we put out the record in eighty eight and eighty nine yeah. we were on the major label. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Probably a little bit too fast, you know, but we just oh, man, we're riding. We just went, okay, sure, let's try it. And then we toured around the US for a long time. Um, you know, and our the guy Gary Gersh who signed us to Geffen had already signed Sonic Youth, so we were already on the label with them. And between us and Sonic Youth, it was a very comfortable place for Nirvana to go. So I mean Nirvana being signed to Geffen had more to do with some youth than us, but our presence there didn't hurt, and they asked us a lot of questions. Oh. You know, and we had the same sound engineer, so we, we were kind of in the same world, the sound degree. Yeah. So then that happened, and we all know what happened after that. Um, and that was good for everybody, I think. Um, and then 
we just carried on. We, we made we started touring in Europe and just doing our thing. But uh, all, always with a very we had our own sound for sure. Did you have a following in Europe also? That's a lot. Well, yeah. So by the our we made one record for Geffen that that did okay in the states, and we toured the states forever, and we toured on our own. We toured with the replacements. We toured with Red Cross. We played to four people usually, um, and then we did our next record, and that got really good reviews in Europe, and so then we were just on tour in Europe all the time, uh, on our own with Teenage Fan Club, blah blah blah, blah. Uh, and things started to happen in the States as well, just kind of, like our third record did actually, and our fourth record did quite well, so then, you know. So what did you break up then? <laughs> well, you know, this, that's how it works, right, just some things are getting good. Um, who knows, you Internal, know, uh, I think just, too long together? Probably. I mean, after you know, we it, it took it was ten years that we split up, you know, and, and that might be the right time, uh, just not, just probably just not being very adult, you know, yeah. um, not really knowing what you want. I knew what I wanted, but I'm not sure my partner. Yeah, you have to be a businessman and, and a musician in America. It's, uh, it's hard to be the two at the same time. Yeah, and just get, there are certain personal things that you can either live with or not. You know, I suppose. I suppose it's like. In anything, but usually, you know, when there's lots of money, that might keep a band together because, like, they kind of have to, you know, in a way. Like the Rolling Stones, probably they don't hang out together. But well, I mean, the Ramones, you know, like, are kind of famous for not liking each other, yeah. but they carry because on. Because that journey the dictator, they stay together. But that like, Pearl Jam, Eddie Vedder doesn't talk to the band, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, but we didn't have enough quite enough I mean we didn't have that much reason to stay together. I mean I thought so, but my partner maybe thought differently. So how did you get them to play with all these amazing guys like Uncle John, Uncle Star, uh, uh, Neil Young, I mean this uh, list of a thousand of people. Yeah, it's Were you like crazy. a studio music musician or Not at all. I mean, I was how do you get to, to, to all these guys? Well, I think just, you know, our, our band, because we had this songwriting thing where people like, oh, these guys, you know, write really nice songs and they're kind of grown up and being so young, etc. Um, that got the attention of certain people like Ringo Starr, etc. We covered one of our tunes. Um, and, you know, we, we, you know, we're very, we were pretty good players, you know, I mean, I, I, I like the playing style of, I like things really primitive, but if I, but I can also play not primitive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, tr I tried to push myself on my instruments a little bit, you know, and then, but also Seattle is just like the world's smallest town, I mean, yeah, really, yeah. everybody knows everybody, so one of the key things is that, you know, R.E.M., guitar player Peter Buck moved to Seattle and he was already friends with all my friends and so he and I became friends and just hey let's go over and play guitar at my house tomorrow and then you're just having fun and then that actually led to a more serious thing where he's like oh we need somebody to come to with us and you so I you keyboards. Keyboard? Keyboard, yeah. keyboards guitar bass and things like that and so of course that opened lots of doors too just the more people you play with just the more things so you do with uh, John Paul Joe from the greatest genius of all well, that was crazy because that was just um, from playing uh, through REM, etc., and also just through being in Seattle and through my own band because he'd come to see my band yeah, before I started producer. playing with. He's with, a good producer, then, yeah. Well, that, but our intermediate friend was Robin Hitchcock. So I played with Robin quite a bit, and that led to John Paul Jones playing with Robin, so then we all played together, this kind of thing. Uh, just, yeah, just stuff like that. You know, just, it's a very tiny network. Uh, you know, and it, I, I think it has to do a lot with this band, Big Star, that, that we all love. Um, and my bandmate in the Posies and I were like the world's biggest Big Star fans, and we ended up playing in this obscure band that everybody loves. You know, R.E.M. loves the band, or plays some slow the band, blah, blah, blah. And so that, that's kind of the centerpiece, I think, of the whole thing. Okay, and uh, so now you got back to the Posies? Yeah, we yeah. still play. Yeah, we uh, we even resolved our differences. Been, yeah, going to tour this America. Now, and, uh, we're going to tour in a few months. Uh, we, we've been touring this year, and we're going to do some more in the states and Europe. Um, you know, we made a new record and things like that. We we patched up our differences some time ago. Yeah, all right. We became adults. 
So I heard you said you told me you live in you live in France. You married with children in France, and uh, but it's not too difficult for you for you uh, for your life, you know, with kids and stuff to travel so much. to be on tour all the year. And, uh, well, yes and no. I mean, like it's it's like what I always have loved doing. You know, playing music. You know, it's like so your wife is the thing. She is very easy on me, yeah. She, I mean, considering that she has, like, the, the leftover job, you know, like, of, okay, I have to do everything for our daughter along the way. And then when I come back, of course, I'm out of the loop, so I'm not even that useful. You know, yeah. oh, yeah, that's great. You're wanting to help, but you're doing it wrong, so I'm just going to do this, you know, this kind of thing. But, you know, I mean, I try and bring work to my studio and be at home as when I can. So you, do you produce also? Yeah, I produce and mix, and then sometimes I just play on records too, that's great too. I do a lot of different things so that I can do all of it, yeah. you know. But, right. but I have to admit that, that touring is something I really love. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 so, it's, so, much, it's so much power, so much, uh, it's uh, like a drug addiction pretty much to go on stage. It's just yeah. special, and, and you know, I like the whole thing, I like traveling. I mean, even though it's hard, and even though like airports and stuff, can suck and everything can be hard. It's not that hard, yeah. you know. Well, we have you haven't traveled. Yeah. One day you used to travel in the seventies. It was a pleasure to travel. Now it's it's hell to travel. Yeah, they they made not, it a little bit less special. Yeah, you know? less special. Okay, let's talk a bit about your movie then. Oh yeah. So, so basically, um, you know, I I met this film director from Germany. Her name's Claudia Rorarius, and she's a fan of the music I make and. We'd always been talking about a project to do together, and it seems like, well, I'll make some music for one of your movies or something like this. Sure, yeah, maybe. She said, no, actually, I think there's something much more interesting. After she got to know a little bit about, about my life story, about things like I adopted, and I'm looking for my real parents, and things like this, something, I, I, I did find that actually, it's, it's actually been quite cool. But before that happened, you know, that search was interesting and just, you know, the whole idea of, of the way I tour, because I, I tour as a solo artist a lot where I might be out alone for like yeah, two months just in a car, like driving around and, you know, I, I meet my friends at the show, but... Yeah, I see you playing 12, in front of three or four people like this in the street sometimes. 12, 12 hours a day I'm just in a car or by myself and that, she thought that was pretty interesting and, you know, just when you have a family and you're away, all, all these different bits, like, ooh, who are you and what makes you what you are and um, how do you find out who you are? And she said, that that to me is a movie and we should make a movie and you should act in it. I said, well, I don't know anything about acting. She said, well, I can teach you a few things and then because you're going to play yourself, basically, it won't be that difficult. You're not going to be like playing Captain Kirk. And you're yeah, you're going to have to learn the to learn text. Yeah, and, uh, you, can, you can be yourself, but, but the story, but there will, will make up a story about these things, so it's not done. It, we're, what we're doing is making a film that basically shows the, the, life, way, the, the way, life, way I live, the but not my musician. actual life. Yeah, the life of a traveling musician. Uh, and, and, and all the personal life. things behind it. And yeah. but, but so much of my real life will be in it that at moments it might be hard to tell if it's yes, a documentary or if it's a fictional film, but ultimately it's a fictional film. So we've been doing a crowdfunding campaign and uh, we got most of the money we need. Still looking uh, for to fund the film, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna run a little address. Yeah, we're gonna, of the video. we're gonna write down a video um, where you where can if you're interested, send you can, by PayPal. You can, you can go, to the, go to the film yeah, website and all those kind of things, and then if you wanna donate to the film, that info will be there too. Okay, we appreciate perfect. that. Perfect, so we'll wait to see you on, uh, on, uh, on your movie. Yeah. And uh, people you should catch him on tour with, uh, with Marky. He's also an amazing singer and stuff. And uh, we wish you good luck then. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, C'est bon? You okay? This is why I said, you know my friend, you're